Welcome back to The Logic Dilemma. I'm your host, American Mike, coming to you from the Purple Mountain Majesties, from sea to shining sea, America the Beautiful. Now, this is the show where we discuss current events and political events and how sometimes thinking logically can get in the way of our feelings. We have a lot of fun on the show. Now, first, I would like to say we just came off of this terrorist attack from ISIS in Russia. ISIS has claimed that they were the ones behind it. Uh, the death toll keeps rising. I I feel so bad for it. I The thing that I feel the most bad about is that a lot of these people, the Russian people, are innocent. And we tend to uh, ignore them because of the political atmosphere of Ukraine and things like that. And I just, I just hope that we can get past this and acknowledge the fact that these people didn't deserve this. These are innocent people. It's not like he had, it's not like they're attacking the government who's currently waging war on Ukraine. They're attacking innocent people and, But I do wonder if people will update their social media profiles with the Russian flag. We stand behind Russia. I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. Anyway, anytime we have a loss of life, it's tragic. I do not like that. Now, Mike Pence has been in the news. He came on, he's been talking about how he doesn't want to endorse Donald Trump. He was on CBS News Face the Nation the other day talking about why he's choosing not to endorse Donald Trump. He said, no doubt, he said this, no doubt in my mind that some people were caught up and entered the Capitol that day. Well, obviously. Here's what else he said. I know in the past you said Mr. Trump's reckless words endangered you and your family on that day. What do you think when you hear him refer to those people facing charges as hostages and patriots? Well, I think it's very unfortunate at a time that there are American hostages being held in Gaza that uh, the president or any other leaders would refer to people that are moving through our our uh, justice system uh, as hostages. And uh, it's just it's just unacceptable. I, I was there on January 6th. I, I have no doubt in my mind, Margaret, that that some people were caught up in the moment and that entered the Capitol. And um, yeah, we know uh, that they're certainly entitled to due process of law for um, any nonviolent activities that day. But uh, the assaults on police officers, ultimately an environment that, that claimed lives uh, is something that uh, uh, I think was tragic uh, that day. And I'll, I'll never diminish it. And the legal system is processing these individuals through and and giving them trials. Um, I wonder what you think, though, about Mr. Trump and whether the public needs to hear and see some of the evidence in regard to the federal charges related to his alleged role in January 6th. Do you think that needs to happen before Election Day? Well, look, I I think the American people live through that moment. I and uh, my family and my team lived through it at the Capitol then. We lived through the moment. Now, keep in mind, the we've talked about this on the program before, that January 6th. The, now, there were people who entered the Capitol. We know that. But the reasons of why they entered the Capitol is still a little fuzzy in my mind. Did they enter the Capitol because we need Trump to be the president? Not really. It's not really true. See, I don't believe Trump was responsible for the actions of a few that broke into the Capitol. We went into detail on this in a previous episode. Trump's speech started almost an hour late, which means the Capitol break-in, which was planned to coincide with the ending of his speech, that break-in ended up starting before Trump finished his speech. Now, 
Who cares, right? <laughs> I don't care. Break-in is a break-in. But the problem is that real Trump supporters were listening to him. They wouldn't have stopped listening to him to go down and break into the Capitol. So at the stage that the break-in starts to occur, I'm unclear of who those people were. They were Trump supporters that don't want to listen to their leader? Okay, it just doesn't add up. But anyway, they break in. But yes, Trump spoke of fighting. We all do. We use dramatic, visionary language to describe where we want to, the point that we want to make. But ultimately, he used the words peace and patriotism. Now, once he uses those words, the violence of the Capitol rests upon the shoulders of those who caused it. Okay. I don't know. Anyway, we, again, we've talked about this in the past. I won't go into it into any detail, but see, Pence thinks that, that some of the Trump's words caused that when he hadn't even finished his speech yet. Truly, truthfully, I don't even know what caused the initial break-in into the Capitol because, well, it is fuzzy. And if you listen to our program where we talk about January 6th, you'll, make, you'll understand what I'm saying. You'll make sense of it. So Mike Pence thinks this. Now, Mike, the reason why I bring all of this up is because we have a problem. Mike, I, I don't even know how to tell you this i don't know if you know this yet i don't know how to how to tell you this we have a very significant issue <sighs> mike after making those comments there was a a comment made on twitter or x about someone who agrees with you and I almost don't even want to say it but Hillary Clinton agreed with you and said and I quote I can't believe I'm saying this but I agree with Mike Pence Mike honestly can we just take a step back from what you're saying if Hillary Clinton is agreeing with you you're in the wrong place okay I'm just going to come right out and say it if Hillary Clinton is agreeing with what you're saying. You're going down a path of which there is no return. We have to be extra vigilant to make sure that we're doing the exact opposite of what any Clinton wants us to do. And if you find yourself in a position where Hillary Clinton is agreeing with you, you need to take a step back and view your life and actually think about where you are and how you got there. Because we cannot allow ourselves to be in any position where any, any Clinton is agreeing with us. Oh my gosh, Mike. I've been so worried about you. Hillary Clinton agreed. Huh. Where do we even go from here? Well, we Trump's back in the news. Uh, he's got to come up with almost five hundred million dollars in cash to post bond on a on a to pay a judgment. Now he says he has the money, but he's dragging it out because he doesn't think it's fair that he has to pay. And I actually I agree. But the truth is that no nobody has that much money lying around. I mean, it, it, it's it's true. David Gelman, this was on Fox News Outnumbered, gave it, David Gelman, a criminal defense attorney and former deputy district attorney, called the judgment a unicorn. He argued that the judge should give Trump a lot more leeway to satisfy the bond because not even the richest man in the world has $464 million lying around, cash. Billionaires... I, what do they think? 
This is how far removed everyone is. What do they think? That billionaires just have money bins of coins that they jump into and swim around as if it were a liquid? No. Most people don't have that much cash lying around. They invest it because they make more money. They'll, you'll lose a lot of money with just cash sitting around. Uh, you'll lose the potential for incredible investment opportunities. Most people don't just leave money sitting around. It's actually irresponsible to leave that much money lying around in accounts just sitting there. It's irresponsible. People need that money. They need the investment opportunities from this. The people, the economy needs that money filtering through it. That's why, that's why we invest in things. That's why we, we, uh, we move toward building, building business and ventures and help people to get jobs and stuff like that. That's what all this money is for. It's irresponsible for it to sit in an account where it's hoarded. So keep that in mind. Now, a lot of people are very worried about this. They're very worried about this. And they're very disturbed by this trial. The fact that Trump is being forced to pay this much money this fast is purely personal. It's not judicial at all. This has nothing to do with the American judicial system. This whole, this whole trial isn't even logical. Nobody was hurt in anything that ever happened. And yet the government wants half a billion dollars. You got Judge Smiley out there. If you haven't seen this guy, I mean, he's a nobody. He will forever, no one will ever remember his name. No one ever cares. Trump will continue to go on to be president, no matter how much you make him pay. He'll go on to be president and you will be left behind with nothing. Because you're a nobody. Now, I know that sounds bitter. I don't mean to sound so bitter. But I can't believe that one man makes a judgment that you have to pay a half a billion dollars. One man makes that, makes you pay it in 30 days, or we're going to start seizing your assets and locking down your bank accounts. This is madness. It's madness. It's like... It's like a third world country. It's, this is dictatorship crap. That we're going to, oh, you have to pay half a billion dollars in 30 days or else we're going to take your property. No, nobody does this. It should be years of non-payment before asset foreclosure is even thought about. But yet, 30 days? Anyway, one of the people that I really love listening to is Kevin O'Leary, who's the Shark Tank guy, Mr. Wonderful, right? He's very successful, very smart, very intelligent, and you know, he does a good job of removing Trump from the equation altogether. He doesn't talk about this like he's a huge Trump supporter. And that's what I love about him. He's talking about it from a business perspective. He was on Fox News is outnumbered. This case by Trump at all anymore. Uh, I think people should be thinking about the policy being put in place here. The competitive competitiveness of New York State versus other U.S. states. But more importantly, the message about the American brand. You think about America, the reason this is the number one economy on earth is that we have laws and we have due process and we have property rights. It attracts foreign capital from all around the world. All of that is being shaken to the core here. The concept of seizing assets in 30 days on a bond number that's never been issued, no insurance bond company's ever issued anything near this. So. There was no chance it was going to happen. And only giving 30 days notice and time. That's a really bad message. A bad message. Again, you're only giving 30 days to come up with money that no insurance would ever, ever support. No one would do that. In fact, there, there's, not a, there's not a chance that anybody would do that. But we, have, we give you 30 days. 30 days. Well, he goes on to say, 
think New Yorkers should think well past Trump. Whether he's president or not, or whether this attorney general is gone in four years or not, it's irrelevant. This is case setting against the American brand. The most stable country on earth, anywhere, to put capital work over a long period of time, particularly in real estate, is the United States of America. This is an, this is an assault on what we believe to be core. And I, I find it extraordinary. I think it's very troubling. It has absolutely nothing to do with Donald Trump at this point, in my view. And it is completely bipartisan. Nothing to do with Donald Trump. And he's right. The judgments of this case have nothing to do with Donald Trump. This is going to affect everyone for the, negatively. It will affect everyone. I can't even believe that we as a people are sitting here allowing this to happen. Whether you like Trump or not, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You could hate Trump till the ends of time. You don't want this to be what America becomes. Seizing property after 30 days on a judgment that is ridiculously set. As well as the fact that he did nothing wrong. The fraud case was completely fraud. One more here. This is an attack on America. Hmm. And, and I don't know how you can look at it any other way. And as, a, as an investor, and I know plenty of investors who are completely disturbed by this. But, I mean, no one is going to put any money to work in New York in, in these amounts until this thing settles down. The whole world is watching, and everybody's waiting for one thing we haven't got yet, adult supervision. Hmm. Where is it? Where are the adults in this crazy narrative? Certainly there's got to be adult supervision at some point. And I understand, you know, the, the war going on here and all the political yada yada, woof, woof, woof. But we need an adult in the room now. This is the United States of America under siege. We need an adult in the room. I couldn't have said it better myself. I love this guy. In fact, I've been, I've really been growing attached to this guy. He says exactly what I'm thinking. We need someone to stand up and say, no, no, we can't do this. This isn't going to work. We can't have a judge setting market values on the bench for one thing. That's, come on. Not to mention, we can't be giving them only 30 days to support a half a billion dollar bond. None of this is making any sense. It's an attack on America, not Trump. So why? Why are we doing this? Well, this is why. This is the attorney general. This attorney general ran on the platform that... I don't care what I have to do. I am going to get Trump. Listen to this. I will never be afraid to challenge this illegitimate president when our fundamental rights are at stake. I believe that the president of these United States can be indicted for criminal offenses. Will you sue him for us? Oh, we're going to definitely sue him. We're going to be a real pain. He's going to know my name personally. That man in the White House. can't go a day uh, uh, without threatening our fundamental rights. Yes, we need to focus on Donald Trump and his abuses. We need to follow his money. We need to find out where he's laundered money. We need to find out whether or not he's engaged in conspiracy. It's important that everyone understand that the days of Donald Trump are coming to an end. I look forward to going into the office of Attorney General every day, suing him, defending your rights, and then going home. What rights? What is she talking about? What rights has Donald Trump taken from anyone? Well, I don't know. The right to have a good economy? The right to have a secure border? No, Donald Trump never did anything wrong. That's the problem with these fraud cases. No, he didn't. No one was ever hurt. 
But you listen to that attorney general, everything that she campaigned on, everything that she did, everything she said, as she talked with the people, as she gave speeches. I'm going to get Trump. I'm going to get Trump. I'm going to get him. I'm going to sue him. She said, I know he's got to have something wrong. We'll, we just have to find it. Well, that's American. I thought, I thought we were innocent until proven guilty. But for some reason, Donald Trump has always been guilty. They just have to find out how. So they find these little little loopholes in the system that they could get him for, like this fraud case. Well, well, well we know no one was hurt. We know no one was, fr no one actually, there were no victims. But we're still going to find you guilty of fraud. No. They find one little loophole and they jump into it because they just have to get him. They know he's guilty of something. We just have to figure out how. Uh, I don't know. We've always been a country where we're innocent until proven guilty. But for some reason, that constitutional right was never afforded to Donald Trump. And, and quite frankly, I'm getting tired of it. Look, I, I, I'm, I'm not saying you got to be BFFs with this guy. You know, you don't have to love Donald Trump. But at least afford him some constitutional rights as an American citizen. And then, not to mention, why are, why are his attorneys powerless? This is what I don't get. People slander him all the time. And yet, no case can ever make it through any type of de defamation for, in, for Trump. But then you've got E. Jean Carroll... Being, saying who knows what and getting paid tens of millions of dollars for it on defamation. But yet every single time Trump tries to bring up a defamation case, nothing. There's one right now open against something that we talked about previously in this, in a, in a previous episode on this program. They're suing ABC News and George, uh, Tiny George, uh, keep in mind, tiny George Stephanopoulos for uh, for the defamation that he claimed that Trump was found liable for rape. He never was. Trump was never found liable for rape. He said it 10, 10, 12 times during the course of an interview. So why is that trial? Why is that defamation not that easy. But if Trump said it about some somebody, it would be fast-tracked. See, I am so tired of this hypo hypocrisy and the hypocritical garbage that we have to deal with. Nobody would ever be found guilty of a half a billion dollars of fraud in this case. It's only because it's Trump. And I'm going to get Trump. I'm going to be the one to take him down. Guess what, a Attorney General? Nobody cares about you. It's, and no one cares about the judge. You're not going to go down in history. No one will ever remember your names. No one cares. Trump will continue to be president. He'll run and hopefully he'll be elected. We'll have good economy again. Everything will be great again. We can make America great again. We can close the stupid border. Something that eludes Democrats. They don't know how to put, they don't know how to close borders. Uh, of course, they all have walls built around their homes. So you would think that they had some sense of idea about how to close borders. They all have walls around their property and gates to get into their multi-million dollar properties. You would think they have some sense of, anyway, 
I'm not even talking about the border right now. I just get so worked up. We've talked about the border in previous episodes of this program. Go check it out. Back to Kevin O'Leary. Yes, it. Trump's cases are a direct assault on America and the American market. That's what this is. This has nothing to do with Trump at this point. You can hate Trump all the live long day and still see that this is unconstitutional. Now, a lot of people were making fun of Trump. Oh, you can't pay it. Oh, you can't pay it. You're, you're not a billionaire, I guess. Yeah, you don't have money lying around. Yeah. So what liberals are saying. Mark Cuban stepped up. We all know Mark Cuban, the world's favorite billionaire, America's favorite billionaire, Mark Cuban. He said, uh, you know, having cash on hand has nothing to do with net worth. Billionaires don't keep a bunch of money lying around. Although Mark Cuban, let me be clear, Mark Cuban, although he came to that defense, he is anything but a Trump supporter. He does. Mark Cuban does not like Trump. You know, let's take let's take a little bit of a break. Let's play a trivia game. Cue music. For today's trivia, we're going to play, we're going to ask one question. That question is, how did Mark Cuban make his money? I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to think about that. The answer is by screwing everyone. <laughs> let me explain. Before everybody gets all mad at me, let me explain. I didn't screw everyone. He, everything was up. Everything was legitimate. But there was a company called AudioNet. Uh, AudioNet was formed around uh, 1989. Late night, late eighties, and eventually AudioNet became Broadcast.com. Now, Mark Cuban bought a small stake in Broadcast uh, in AudioNet, which then became Broadcast.com. Remember, in the nineties, domain names like Broadcast.com were still available. Nowadays, you can't find any name to do anything. But anyway, Broadcast.com in the mid nineties was available so they it what a great domain name really now i a little bit about myself before we continue i have been architecting and engineering software for 25 years that's what i do i write software i write web based i write internet-based software i have been doing this for some of the largest corporations in the world for 25 years. I have I have had startups. I have done other things. I have written software. I, I enjoy it. And you know what? I'm really good at it. I'm a freaking genius when it comes to writing software. So I, although I'm a lot younger than Mark Cuban, I started around the mid-90s also in my late teen years. But I remember... All of the events as they transpired. I remember following it because it was a big deal. Broadcast.com sold to one of the biggest internet companies in the world. Yahoo.com. You remember Yahoo? Oh, uh, those were the days. Yahoo. What a, what a great company they were. Are. They're still around. They're still around. But they bought Broadcast.com in 1999 for a whopping $5.7 billion in stock. So Mark Cuban's company 
that he owns a, a, a significant stake in for $5.7 billion in stock. Immediately that year, <laughs> this, this just blows my mind. Immediately he hedged his shares against Yahoo. What that means is he basically bet on Yahoo's demise. So, so let me get this straight. A company, the biggest company in the world, internet company, I should say, buys your company for $5.7 billion in, share, in stock. And you immediately, that year, bet all of that against them. <laughs> Why? Why would you do that? Unless somehow you knew that what you just sold them was a steaming pile of garbage. Now, the deal was legitimate, but has been named one of the worst internet purchase transactions in the history of the world. Why? Well, because when Yahoo bought Broadcast.com, they had all of these grand ideas of what they were going to do with it. It was unusable. It was failing when they bought it. Now, it's not Mark Cuban's fault, okay? It was Yahoo's fault. Yahoo should have done their due diligence. Had they done that, we would have never heard the name Mark Cuban. Had Yahoo just looked into Broadcast.com for even a slight second, we never would have heard the name Mark Cuban. But they didn't. They bought it. They bought Broadcast.com for an incredible amount of money, unbelievable amount of money uh, in shares, in stock, not knowing that Cuban was going to turn around and hedge the shares, but against Yahoo. What do you think that does for a company when the market and everybody playing the stock market sees that five, over five and a half billion dollars of shares are being hedged? You, you don't think that has a negative impact? That you see that that many shares are being bet against the company? You're betting that the company, on the company's risk, the company's failing? What, is, what do you think that does for the market? So in 1999, he, bet, he bets against Yahoo, and he's out there buying private jets on eBay. Still holds a Guinness Book World's record for that. See, now I'm watching all of this unfold as, as a pretty young guy. Just starting out in the industry. I know Yahoo. I had applied for jobs at Yahoo. I loved Yahoo. And, and I was watching them very closely. So I was watching this. This entire thing transpire. And yet, Mark Cuban... Bets against them. Now, he has said that he's very lucky because he sold the company before the dot-com burst. Remember the bubble burst? The dot-com bubble burst was only a couple years later. If that. The whole dot-com bubble burst. Who was at the, who was at the front of that dot-com bubble burst? Yahoo. They didn't have the valuation they needed to make it through. And a lot of companies failed because Yahoo was failing. Now, Yahoo is okay. And they're still around today. And they have good products. But I'm telling you, they were hit the hardest through that dot-com bubble burst. So you've got Cuban out here saying, well... Had I not hedged my shares against the, the Yahoo, I would have lost half my fortune. Well, guess what? Everybody in the industry sees it a little bit different than you do. We think, had you 
not hedged your shares against Yahoo, they wouldn't have lost the valuation they did. And it is of the opinion of a lot of people in the industry, in the software and internet business industry at that, I mean, time has been, it's been so long that no one cares anymore. But at the time, a lot of people believe that Mark Cuban actually helped the dot-com bubble burst. So there you go. He sold them nothing. You know that? Broadcast.com, it was nothing. It was like it was like somebody, if you were to compare that to a real-world example, it would have been like you see someone, you see this guy out in his driveway polishing his Ferrari, and you walk up and you go, wow, you've taken such good care of this Ferrari. What's the market value of this? And he says, well, it's about 500 500 grand. Well, I'll take it. So you say, I'll take it. You hand him the cash and you say, I am so excited because this Ferrari is so beautiful. And you get in, you turn the key and it doesn't, and nothing, nothing doesn't start. So you pop the hood and there's no engine. And you turn to the guy and you go, wait, wait a minute. And the guy goes, oh, no, all sales final. In fact, I've already spent your money. And you go, well, it doesn't have an engine. Well, you never asked. Oh. So you sold us a Ferrari without an engine. But you sold it to us for market value. But we it's completely useless to us. We can't even drive it. Well, should have done your homework. Sorry. That's what happened. That's the equivalent of what happened. Oh, where were we? I am off on a tangent. I am so sorry about this. Mark Cuban. Oh, Mark Cuban stuck up for Donald Trump, even though he hates Donald Trump. Mark Cuban has made his money. America's favorite billionaire as he invests his money, initially making his money off of. And you know what? If you ask all of his business partners at the time and during broadcast.com, if you ask, well, not all. Most of his business partners, guess what they'll tell you? Ah, Cuban screwed us. That, that's what they'll tell you. That's their opinion. I don't, I don't know if it's true, but their opinion is of is that of that he pretty much screwed everybody. He took a lot of money and ran, uh, promising the world to people who are never paying out. Now, again, legally, that's okay. Um. If that's all that's important to you, then legally that's fine. He can do whatever he wants. Anyway, so think of all of this next time you see Mark Cuban talking about investments and why well, he is. I mean, it was smart what he did, but at the expense of, I mean, what, what did it cost? It cost, uh, what he did cost the market a lot. And cost a lot of companies a lot at the expense of making him rich so that he can buy jets on eBay. Nothing that he did was illegal. Nothing he did was even immoral. I mean, if you can make whatever money you want to make, go ahead and do it. But uh, it is, it was a very... Um, eye-opening deal. So I think of that every time I see Mark Cuban talk about talk about anything. I think about broadcast.com and how he sold for $5.7 billion, he sold the contents of his trash can. That's unbelievable. He's either he's either the worst person in the world or the smartest person in the world. But think about that next time you see Mark Cuban and his, and I, to quote the late great Rush Limbaugh, with his excrement eating grin on his face. Think about that next time you see that. Anyway, I am so sorry for the tangent. Let's get back to, let's get back to business. This whole Donald Trump trial, very, very troubling for America. Truly is. Now, let's shift gears a little bit. It's a little bit more, more, uh, a completely different topic. 
Completely different topic. Biden's Intel community circulated a newsletter on cross-dressing. A newsletter on cross-dressing. Um... The newsletter states that this edition also has articles that speak to inclusivity, more broadly exploring gender identity, advances in accessibility, and diversity in leadership. These are the contents of this newsletter that was sent out. And an officer wrote, I am an intelligence officer, and I am a man who likes to wear women's clothes sometimes. The author wrote, I think my experiences are as someone who cross-dresses have sharpened the skills I use as an intelligence officer, particularly critical thinking and perspective taking. It is challenging for some people to understand cross-dressing and non-binary or gender fluid people because gender is a part of overall identity. So gender... He added, many of us think of our identities as fixed, and some find this approach to gender threatening to their own identity. So it's true that this entire community doesn't want to think of gender as being fixed. Let me be, let's talk about this for a second, because we talk about, we talk about logic, because this is the logic dilemma. The problem that logic poses for all of us. Now, this wanting to change your gender is not a logical aspect of life. It is purely emotional. So we've talked about how logic and emotion are used to determine decision making and 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 whether what we the paths that we take in life, logic and emotion are used for those. But the trans community is not logical. It's not. Not logical at all. It's purely emotion-based. Now, I'm not talking about homosexuality. I believe you can be gay and still be logical. I'm talking about people wanting to change their biological Gender. Just look at the word bio, meaning life, and logical, meaning natural, sensible, or of sound reasoning. So, trans is not logical. The biological, your biological gender is ignored when we speak of the trans community. It's purely emotional. Changing of gender. Uh, uh, Changing of gender, I almost said changing of genitals. <laughs> That's not logical either, by the way. <laughs> but changing of gender is not a log- <laughs> logical thing. It is emotional. Now, I, I actually believe they should create a new word for this. Biological doesn't match. Biological doesn't work. What is your biological gender? It actually doesn't, biological doesn't work in the trans community. I think they need a new word. I, actually, and I'm actually being serious. I'm not even trying to be funny. I think, they, I think it should be called your bio-emotional gender. You have biological gender and bio-emotional gender. <laughs> I, I really do. I think they should coin the phrase. This is your bio-emotional gender. Because there aren't, and, and I am, I am, everybody knows this. There aren't enough medications and surgeries or hormone treatments in the world to change your biological gender. There is nothing you can do about it. Your biological gender is your gender. You There's nothing you can do. That's the logical aspect of life. That's logic. 
Now, emotionally, yeah, your bio-emotional gender is fluid. If you want to change your bio-emotional gender, sure. Go right ahead. You can change that. But keep in mind, your emotion, your emotional choices and the emotional choices that you make are only for you. You can't force others to recognize your emotional choices. That's for you. You can only, you can only have peop, force people to recognize your logical choices. So your bioemotional gender is fluid, and you can change that. But look, and, and truly, everyone can do anything you want. If a man wants to dress as a woman, go ahead. It's none of my business. I don't care. But it becomes my business when I'm being forced to acknowledge your delusion. And which is what it is. And I know this is being considered hate speech nowadays. It's not. It's real. You can't change your gender. You can only emotionally do so, and you can't force people to agree with your emotional decisions. So this isn't hate speech. And you can be mad all you want. You cannot change the facts. You can't change your gender. You just can't. No matter what path you take, you will always be a man dressed in women's clothing. And I don't care how progressive or woke you are. 99% of the time, everyone knows. I don't care who you are. You can be the biggest supporter of trans rights in the world. And when a man walks up to you and calls himself a her, you know it's a man. Because that's logical and our brains are logical and even if for a split second before you forcibly push that thought out of your mind you will know oh this is a man okay because you have to force that thinking every single time because logic makes sense and that's the first thing your brain's going to see is logic so Unless, unless by chance you're a man acting as a woman and you're the sliver of percentage where those around you can't tell. <laughs> it's extremely rare, by the way. It's more rare than the trans community wants to acknowledge. Where you have a man who actually does look like a woman. Then congratulations, you just won the lottery. Because that's how rare it is. We can all tell. Even if people pretend they don't, we will always tell. And we'll always pretend that we can't tell, but we can. For, for, I mean, for all of you, I mean, it's very rare to come across someone that you can't tell. We can all tell you're still, you're, we can all tell your biological gender. And again, I don't care, but forcing me to go along with it, is like walking me outside at high noon on a sunny day and forcing me to proclaim it is nighttime. You're trying to make everyone acknowledge something that we all know isn't true. That's, that's what this is. This whole argument is logic versus emotion at its finest. This is what the logic dilemma means. This is why I have the show. It are cases like this. Because for the trans community, logic is a problem. It's a, it's a dilemma. It's something we, they want us to forget about the logic of it. Well, 
look, at the end of the day, I want you to be happy. I do. And I want you to be yourself. And if you want to go and dress as some, as a different gender, by all means, that is your choice, not mine. And you're free to do so. I think some of the problems that we have in the trans community is that they, de- they need to just own it. Just own it. Instead of saying, hey, all of you, you have to acknowledge that I'm a woman. Instead of saying that, because that's actually not going to work. Everybody knows. And, and it just makes you look, it makes you come off as, well, non-logical. If you want to balance logic and emotion in your decision making, then just say, hey, everyone, I'm a man and I want to dress as a woman now. Own it. Psychologically, you will be so much healthier if you just own the fact that you're a man and you want to be a woman instead of trying to be the woman. You see what I mean? You'll never be the woman. But you can always succeed, and you will never succeed at being a woman. But you will, you can, however, succeed in being a man who wants to be a woman. So follow what you can succeed at. And own it! Because psychologically, again, you'll be a lot healthier. Like logic versus emotion at its finest. Speaking of which, the comedian Stephen Colbert, (laughs) I know, a very odd segue here. (laughs) The the comedian Stephen Colbert was in the news. Uh, Because he, he made a comment about Prince William having an affair and he's, he received a legal letter from the per, the girl he claims allegedly had the affair with and Stephen Colbert was issued a cease and desist or, or so ab- about. Okay. Stephen Colbert. Why did I bring Stephen Colbert up? Well, because Stephen Colbert is I, you may not know this, and this is very interesting. You may not know this, but he's actually what I refer to as a trans comedian. He is. He's a trans comedian. This is why. This is why we segwayed from transgender to the comedian Stephen Colbert as being trans comedian. I. I know that this is extremely difficult for you to understand for yourself. And that's why I'm just here to help. I want to be of service. In the spirit of inclusivity, I want to make sure that we're all aware. Again, me informing you of this is a service that I am rendering. It is my civic duty to help you understand that Stephen Colbert self-identifies As a comedian. Yeah, he does. I know. I know. You you would never know this by watching his show. I know. But he identifies as someone who is, quote unquote, funny, or he identifies as a, quote unquote, comedian. Now, as you know, Stephen Colbert took over the late show from, how do I put it? Oh, I know. From the biological funny man, David Letterman. David Letterman is a biological comedian. Meaning, he's just a comedian. I grew up watching his show. I loved it. Funny guy. But Stephen Colbert took over his show, which might I add, (laughs) might, we should look at this whole situation as incredibly inspiring to all of us. Truly. Stephen Colbert is an inspiration. He inspires all of us to reach for the stars because if a seemingly normal, everyday, unfunny person can get their own 
show on CBS, then the sky's the limit for all of us. There's no telling what people who actually have even a shred of talent can accomplish. If he can get that, then we should all succeed. So he's an inspiration. Thank you, the comedian Stephen Colbert. Now, I've wa- I, I watched Stephen Colbert's show many times. Many times. Before someone informed me that it's actually supposed to be funny. I had no idea. As I, I'm sure a lot of you. I had no idea. He actually does a great job of hiding, hiding the fact that this is supposed to be a funny show. I just figured the format had changed from biological funny man, biological comedian... David Letterman. I just figured they changed the format. That's when I realized Stephen Colbert's desired pronouns and identifiers. He's a trans comedian. An unfunny person who wishes to self-identify as a quote-unquote comedian. So, I'm inclusive on this program. I want everyone to feel seen, accepted, recognized. I have taken it upon myself to show my support while getting the word out. That's why I always include Stephen Colbert's pronouns. I always refer to him as the comedian Stephen Colbert or Stephen Colbert the comedian. If I didn't perform this service, there's no way you would ever know that he identifies as a comedian. You would never know that. That's why I provide this service. I want, he, I want everyone to be happy. I want everyone to feel loved. The comedian, Stephen P- Colbert, alleged that Prince William had a, an affair and he was asked to stop, legally stop. You are dangerously Walking that fine line, the comedian Stephen Colbert, you are dangerous, dangerously walking that fine line of defamation. I wouldn't take that lightly. And who knows if she's got E. Jean Carroll in her, in her corner because, goodness gracious, you'll lose everything, Stephen Colbert, the comedian. You will lose everything. By the way, Will and Kate, yeah, don't attack Will and Kate. They're, they're the shining example of what a real, true, loving family is. This is why the world loves them so much. You've got a loving father, a loving mother, a loving family. The family unit seems very strong with them. Don't, don't attack that. We need it. We need more examples of what a true family is. Because, and what love is. Everybody's was mad at Kate. I know she just came out and, and announced her cancer diagnosis. And we're so sorry for that. Hope you're the best. But... Keep in mind, everybody got jumped down her throat just a couple of weeks ago because she edited video, um, edited um, images. I couldn't understand that. Who cares? I mean, who cares if she's editing videos of her and her family? Do we? Is that a is that a bad thing? Anyway, I don't get it. I really don't. I think we should all be nicer to them because they are what a family should be. And on that note, I am leaving you there. Listen, America, stay strong. Make logical decisions and find ways to balance that logic and emotion. I am American Mike, and this is The Logic Dilemma. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share. Get the word out. Thanks, America. Thanks, America.